We are so pleased to be joined by Anthony Roth Costanzo, General Director and President, the brand new appointee of Opera Philadelphia. Welcome to Philadelphia and welcome to WRTI. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. As soon as this uh, announcement was made, um, we were immediately like, we cannot wait to talk to Anthony about his plans for this company. Um, as you know, Opera Philadelphia means so much to the arts community here in Philly. Uh, it means a lot to us. Um, and so I guess I wanted to start with a very sort of deceptively straightforward question. Um, you are uh, an internationally acclaimed opera singer, countertenor, um, very much still in the prime of your career. And this is an administrative job. Why did you decide to take it? Well, you know, I've been producing shows for a long time. And why did I start producing shows? Because as a countertenor, you don't get to sing Tosca, you don't get to sing the standard rep. So I, I felt like I had to create more repertoire, more things for myself to do. That's how it began. And then I found myself sometimes bored by opera. I felt like the industry was sometimes cycling through the same things, and I wanted to make more creative, collaborative projects. Mm -hmm. So that began 10 or 15 years ago, and I have have crescendoed that producing into really big projects, including Glass Handle here at Opera Philadelphia. And as I did that, I realized that I could have a different kind of impact making things happen than I could as a singer. And that impact felt important. How can we help this art form move into the future? How can we change the structures around it so that more people can access it and more people can have their lives changed by art? And so that became an important mission to me. Um, And I wanted to find the right place to have that impact. And when I saw that Opera Philadelphia was looking for a new leader, I thought, wow, this is a company I know and I love, and a company that has been at the forefront of innovation, of the creation of new work, of reimagining the classics, of all kinds of really exciting artistic work. And I thought, this is a perfect place um, and a nimble place Mm -hmm. to, to do some of the work that I have been exploring in my personal career, but that I wanted to take into a bigger scale. Do you think of yourself as an organizer? Is, is this a part of your personality that goes that goes way back? Absolutely. When I was in high school, um, I had I was in North Carolina, and I really didn't feel like I fit in. You know, I would wear all black, and and the jocks were wearing khaki shorts and white sneakers, and I just was trying to find a way to fit in. So I remember I started the cooking club, and uh, we did it for charity, and we wound up being the hit of the school. We had waffle sales. We everybody loved the cooking club. We raised thousands and thousands of dollars for charity. So I remember even in those early days, that was my freshman year of high school, I was an organizer. Um, And that's a big part of my personality. I like creating community and seeing the power of community and and also being able to deliver uh, wonderful things to a whole network of people um, and creating these kind of win-win situations. Yeah. Now, Opera Philadelphia, you knew the company, you had worked with the company before coming in, and so you were familiar with how vital and, and as you say, how creative an institution this is. And I know you were also familiar with David Devan and his legacy, you know, really a kind of a legendary tenure. At the same time, this is a company that Uh, really struggled with some pandemic conditions. You know, um, you entered this situation um, with, you know, a few problems that you had to address straight away. Um, Probably the most, uh, the the biggest being this issue of debt that the company had incurred. So knowing all of this coming in, um, the creative potential and the sort of um, financial and practical challenges, what was your first priority? How did you sort of calibrate um, all of the needs and ambitions that you had you know, on day one? Well, it's certainly been a big learning curve. And I didn't know the full extent of everything until I took the job. Of course, you have to look under all the carpets and see what's hidden where. But in fact, there was an operational debt when I took office on June 1st. And that had to be solved immediately, or we weren't going to have a season or potentially an opera company. Mm -hmm. So I had to take that head on. And I had to think creatively. And this is where being an artist comes in handy, right? Because you put your creative thinking cap on. 
and try and problem solve. And I love solving problems. So while I was very excited about the artistic possibilities and the artistic planning, and everyone expected me to really dig into that to begin with as an artist, I actually wanted to lean into not only the fundraising, but the organizational structure and the economic models that would allow for a sustainable and really stable future for Opera Philadelphia, because that's going to inform the work we can do and the work we can program. How do we live within our means and still be a leader in the industry? So I had to think really carefully, what are those economic models? How can I solve this cash flow problem in no time flat that is a $4 million problem, right. essentially? Um, and so I came up with several solutions, which I can happily Please. tell you about. Yes. Um, one thing is that when I was interviewing for the job, they asked me if there was anything missing from the mission. And I said, you know, there's one word I feel is mission, missing, and that's collaboration. And I had created, before coming to Opera Philadelphia, an incubator called Scene, and I wanted to sort of incorporate that incubator into the way that Opera Philadelphia functions to connect us to new audiences through engagement, to help us create new kinds of work, whether it was new operas or, or canonical works reinterpreted. But it was kind of a think tank and a, an engine for innovation. And that that implanting that within Opera Philadelphia was going to help define a new collaborative model and help us bridge the gap to many organizations interdisciplinarily in the city and nationwide in terms of collaboration. So that has really helped drive some of our thinking and some of the new economic modeling that we're going to do in terms of how do we pool resources with other companies, with other producing partners in order to, to be more efficient and more effective. Um, but then I began thinking about how are we going to get people to give money quickly mm -hmm. and how are we also going to solve the problem that tickets were not selling at the rate that they were selling before the pandemic and also in general in the arts in our country, we know that tickets aren't selling very well. Um, and so I was uh, thinking about how to solve this, and I received a major gift for innovation. And then I decided that in looking at ticket revenue and the projections of ticket net revenue and being realistic about it, that tickets were only going to constitute about 8% of our revenue. That's a very small percentage. And yet, we had to think about programming to drive ticket sales. We had to think about marketing to drive ticket sales. And if you, if you break down what that means, it means who can afford a $150 ticket? Where do they live? Where do they spend their time on social media? And how can we reach those people? What will those people come see? Will they come see Carmen? Okay, we should program Carmen. So it was really confining a lot of who we were reaching and what we were doing. And were we going to do that to make 8% of the money? So I realized that counterintuitively, we had to give up some money in order to make some money. And that's how I came up with Pick Your Price, which is a program where every ticket from the front row to the balcony to the box is $11. And or you can choose what you pay. You can give a donation. You can choose to pay the standard price, which might be $150 for that ticket. But um, you can pay what you're comfortable with. You could also pay 30 bucks for that ticket. So I said, OK, what impact will that have? That's an experiment that, that we had to take and a risk we had to take. But the idea that we would be inviting this city to the opera and that you could come for $11. I wanted the board, I wanted our patrons to invest in that. Instead of investing in the debt that had accrued, which is not an exciting thing to give money to, right. can you invest in this whole new opera company and a new way of operating and a model that we might be able to set for the industry if it works for everyone? And so we were able to raise $7 million in 10 weeks. We were able to cancel all accrued current debt at Opera Philadelphia. And we have launched Pick Your Price last week. And um, there have been some really astonishing results in the first 48 hours. Well, I was going to ask because it's been, as we're speaking, it's been about a week since this news went public. And that's, you know, no time, but it's enough time for you to know whether this was a success. And it sounds like it really was. 
I only have the numbers today officially from the first 48 hours. So I'll tell you what happened. As a control on Monday, we sold 20 tickets. Mm -hmm. On Tuesday, we launched Pick Your Price. And then the subsequent 48 hours, we sold 5,876 <laughs> tickets. Wow. That, that means, first of all, of those tickets, 64% were people who had not bought tickets at Opera Philadelphia before. And that means that in 48 hours, we sold 52% of all tickets available for the entire season. So on average, our houses for the entire season are above 80% full now already. And this does not include what happened in the, in the time since then. We know that they're even more full and close to sold out. And what does that mean? I sat at home and I thought, as someone who's been doing opera for 30 years, what does that mean? Everyone's been saying, well, people just don't want to go to the opera. Do they not want to go to the opera in 48 hours if almost 6,000 people come and buy almost all of the tickets available? They want to go to the opera. It means that price is a barrier. There's been a lot of discussion online. Does it devalue the product? You know, people pay to go to Taylor Swift. They pay to go to Beyonce. They pay to go to an Eagles game. Why can't they pay to go to the opera? We shouldn't devalue the product. Well, what I think is that the reality is people aren't paying to go to the opera. Do I think that they should? Well, I think the opera has a lot of value. You're seeing millions of dollars on stage. But we are paying the artists. We're paying the musicians. We're paying the crew. We're paying everybody. And I think we have to let people discover the value of opera. Art can change people's lives. And I've received so many messages in the past week from a singer whose family has never been able to afford to come see him in the opera, from a set designer who wanted to learn about opera as a student but couldn't afford to go and so never has designed an opera, from all kinds of people whose lives are changed by being able to bring their children to the opera instead of having them stay home with a babysitter, to be able to come to the opera at all because they can bring their family. You know, if you imagine what a night for a family of four cost at the opera before, it's upwards of $400 to sit anywhere where you can see and hear. Mm -hmm. And now you can go out for less than the cost of dinner in most circumstances. So I think it's a transformative initiative. Will it change our bottom line? I, I get a lot of messages saying, well, how much, how much money are you losing? And really, I want the focus to come away from ticket sales generating revenue because it is only 8% of our revenue. So whether we, if we lose a few hundred thousand dollars or even a million dollars, I think it sends an important message. And I would hope that the foundations, the corporations, and the individuals continue to come to support us. Because even with all the money we've raised in 10 weeks, we need to continue to support this program. We need to support the rest of our season and the art we make. And I hope that when people come to the opera, it will be a different experience. We know it's going to be a different demographic in all ways, in terms of age, in terms of race, in terms of the regions people come from. We already can see that uh, the, the greater Philadelphia area, they're buying tickets now. Mm -hmm. So if the opera feels different to go there, if that experience feels different, I hope that will excite people and engage them in a different way. And that's what will build value for the opera. But we can't start and say... There's value here. Even if you don't see it, we expect you to pay for it. Right. It strikes me that at the heart of this whole um, initiative is this question you're posing, which is, who is opera for? Um, and your answer appears to be everybody, <laughs> right? Um, and and so with that, a conviction that the, the art form and the product itself... Um, that's not the problem, right? It's like there are, there's a structural model that has, you know, whether it crept along that path, um, however it got there, it got to a place where, you know, this was just a forbidding um, set of circumstances for most, you know, many people, if not most people. Um, and so it, it's really heartening to see um, this kind of trial balloon, you know, this, this experiment and a very, very fast, affirmative response, right? Um, now, you belong to this generation that um, 
has been doing a lot in this in this realm to try to um, show that this art form is not only alive and well, but has relevance, has urgency um, in our present day. I was just looking at a new book by Yuval Sharon, um, A New Philosophy of Opera. And there's a concept that Yuval floats, um, which is anti-elitism. Um, and as you're talking about this initiative, um, it feels very much in sync with that idea. Um, is that something that you've looked at, uh, the way that he frames that argument? Um, can you speak to that? Yeah, and Yuval and I are friends, and I think we both believe in this anti-elitism in opera. And we approach it in slightly different ways, but I think it's important to have those different approaches. But what you said is crucial, which is that the art itself is not elite, and it's not forbidding. People feel that it's difficult to access, but in fact, when you come see it and you see a story play out on stage and the music moves you, you realize that it can speak to anyone. But the structures around opera, especially today, have become forbidding, as you say, and elitist. And so how do we change those structures so that people can experience the art and decide for themselves if they like it? Sometimes, you know, when I go to a baseball game, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm trying to follow all the rules and learn them. And many people have done that better than me. But as soon as I start learning what the rules are and what's happening, then I get really excited about it. Well, opera's just the same, mm -hmm. you know? So I don't think there's anything inherently um, elite about the art, but I do think when the tickets cost that much and when it, and, and, and then that determines who's going to the opera, what they're wearing, what the uh, associations are with that, all of the different things that start to feel um, exclusionary or start to feel like there's no place for, for someone, that's when we get distance from the art form. And then what happens is that the art form moves farther and farther away from the zeitgeist, right, from culture. And then as such, people aren't interested and the patrons who have supported opera are incredibly important. I don't want to alienate them. I want them to take pleasure in a new generation, in a new crowd, and and in older people who've never experienced the opera, experiencing it for the first time and sharing it with them because these people have been steadfast and they've supported it and they've kept it going and now they're going to pass it on in a new and exciting way. So I'm not trying to to get rid of anyone, mm -hmm. I'm trying to make it um, a party for everybody. The uh, production that Opera Philadelphia is about to open this new season with is The Listeners, Missy Mazzoli's um, opera. Um, and this is a perfect example of um, leaning into this idea of accessibility in the sense that this is an American story. It, you know, utilizes aspects of... Um, you know, it's it's the story of a cult. It's the story of a mysterious phenomenon. It's a mass media um, story. You know, it's the story of, um, you know, a suburb and a school teacher. And, you know, there are all these things that are very familiar. The texture of this story is familiar. And um, Liliana Blaine Cruz's production makes that even more so, you know. With that, I, I wonder... Um, is this a perfect example of the kind of production that you want to prioritize with Opera Philadelphia? Um, and if so, is there still a place in the calendar for, um, you know, the classic productions, you know, for a Carmen, you know, for a Madame Butterfly? What is the balance that you are hoping to strike? Well, I'm so excited about the listeners. You know, it represents exactly what Opera Philadelphia does so well. Missy Mazzoli is, of course, a native Philadelphian, but also was a composer in residence at Opera Philadelphia. And her breaking the waves was really a, a, a blockbuster moment for opera, for her, for Opera Philadelphia. So now that she can return and do something in the Academy of Music at a huge scale, this is just a huge, huge opera, mm -hmm. which is so exciting. It's grand opera in the best way. Um, you know, this is this is a progression and trajectory that represents 
a success story for Opera Philadelphia. So we definitely want to keep doing this. And it's an opera that we have commissioned. Um, so it's incredibly exciting. And to have an artist like Liliana Blaine Cruz, along with Royce Favrick, who wrote the libretto, and Jordan Tannehill, who wrote the story, you know, these are artists that we want to collaborate with who are thinking about our time and the stories we can tell. And I think you're right. It's a very American story. And it comes in the moment of an election when it is thinking about America, the vulnerabilities, the isolation people feel, the separation people feel, and how they search for a place of belonging. And as we enter the election, I think meditating on that, seeing it through this lens of beauty that is Missy's music that she's written, that's what opera does best. It gives us perspective. It allows us to zoom out, and it gives us a kind of empathy. And I think it gets our minds turning in a way that's different from all the political ads and chatter and the noise that we hear and that this opera is about, you know, mm -hmm. the noise in our society. So I think it's a perfect example of opera's relevance and how it can really help us get through all the complications of modern life. But I don't want to do away with the canon, with the incredible music that opera represents. So, you know, Opera Philadelphia has always represented a balance of new work, canonical work, and imaginative uh, ways to think about what opera can mean. So I want to keep presenting works from the canon, but I want them to be imagined through the eyes of artists from other disciplines, of artists who have creative ways of, of constructing these stories and maybe reinterpreting them at times. But I also um, am personally you know, really interested in the stories we tell that are relevant to our community and figuring out, you know, how, as we reshape our audience, how those stories have a new kind of resonance. Um, and so I'm looking at programming from all different angles. Um, and I think you're going to see things that expand the definition of what opera is. Opera is really drama through music, but there has always been art in the set design. There's been fashion in the costumes. There's been technology from the early pulley systems, but now we have all other kinds of technology to include. And then there's, you know, philosophy and history and academics of all kinds. So I think collaboration is the key in mm -hmm. my programming going forward. Yeah, you know, when you mentioned collaboration earlier in regards to the the mission, you know, that was the thing that flashed through my head. It's like, what is a more fundamentally collaborative art form? Um, you know, any part of that um, falling flat and you have a problem. You know, you have a problem with your production, right? Um, so that seems, that seems really crucial. Um, I wanted to ask you about scale as well, because... You have um, starred in productions at the Metropolitan Opera. Um, you've done um, a lot of work um, in a lot of very big and, and slightly smaller um, operas. And Opera Philadelphia, is, is it sits in an interesting sort of niche. It's kind of this mid-sized company. Um, and you're going to continue to do work with the Met. Um, what is the, the place that this company... Um, holds in the operatic ecosystem. Um, you know, why is it important to have a thriving mid-sized company in addition to, you know, the Met, you know, up, up I-95 doing its, you know, massive productions? Like, why is it important that we have this, this tier thriving? That's such a great question. I think the key word is discovery. You know, I love the Met and I love what they do and it's at such a high level. And I want them to keep doing it. But of course, they're a titanic ship. So any sudden turns are more challenging for an institution of that size. And they also have to represent uh, uh, in, in their way a certain, you know, um, 
institution. Opera Philadelphia is much more nimble. It's a place where you're going to discover works you didn't know you like. You're going to discover singers you didn't know. You're going to discover directors, ideas, and you're going to see some famous people or famous ideas or famous operas. But I think Opera Philadelphia needs to be a place where we discover, oh, there's a new economic ticketing model. That works really well. Oh, here's a singer we've never heard of. Wow, I didn't know Rossini wrote an opera like that. I've never seen that at the Met. This is a place of discovery, and I want it to be a leader in the field and in the country as such. And I think that's our key. Because we're not a Titanic ship, because we're a little motorboat that could, we can zoom around, we can make quick turns, we can respond to what's happening. Our planning isn't as far out. And as such, we can be really nimble and a, a place where people come from all over the world to discover new things about opera. That's a really good point. And, um, but sticking with the Met for a moment, I do want to um, flash back to a memorable um, couple of moments that I've had as an audience member. Um, I was at the premiere of... Um, Terrence Blanchard's Fire Shut Up in My Bones. And when you talk about who is opera for, the energy in the hall on that evening, which, you know, I subsequently felt, uh, you know, when they presented his champion and on a few other occasions, uh, it, it's really exciting because there was this feeling that, you know, there were people in that hall who do not typically go to opera. And not only did they feel welcomed, but they felt that this was a story this was um, a production that had them in mind, um, had their stories at, it, at its center. Um, and so I'm talking, of course, about communities of color. I'm talking about, um, you know, people whose um, stylistic compass, you know, is pointed in another direction. Now, this is another thing that Opera Philadelphia has done over the years. Um, and so I'd love to hear you talk about um, that that issue of inclusivity and representation and where that uh, sits as a priority for you, too. Well, I think understanding the makeup of our audience, especially with this Pick Your Price, and then finding their stories and, and putting those on stage is really important. We have an incredible partnership with the Apollo Theater, and the work that we're developing and that we're thinking about is incredibly exciting to me. But, you know, it's important that the voices singing in opera and the voices creating opera are representative of the communities coming to see opera and that want to see opera, as you say, because it's important for people to see themselves on stage and vice versa. Um, I think it's important for the people on stage to see audience members who reflect them. Mm -hmm. And I want this new ticketing program and I want our collaborations through the Apollo, through all of our incredible community partners um, to represent the work that is going on stage. So we're thinking very carefully and very creatively about how we make sure that that's a part of our programming. But it's also important to me not to do anything that is tokenizing, mm -hmm. not to do anything that checks boxes for the sake of checking boxes, and um, not to uh, do work that virtue signals in any way. I'm interested in the art and I'm interested in the human stories. And so I talk to people and I understand what they're excited about and I figure out how I can facilitate that story being told in a way that's going to make exciting art. And that's what I'm interested in. I try not to think about it as a quota that I need to fill or um, a, a, I, I see it as a responsibility for sure, but not as a uh, you know, um, something I can use to fundraise on or anything like that. I am genuinely committed to creating a community, listening to them, and then putting those stories into the art. You um, have history with Philadelphia, um, and you now have a, a, a place in Center City. Um, and so, you know, you're, you're kind of an adopted Philadelphian uh, once again. There's an interesting... Um, kind of ecology of, of the arts in this town. Um, and, and so I wonder what thoughts you have about Opera Philadelphia's relation to the, the greater arts community in Philadelphia, not just with you know, respect to other classical music institutions, but you know, the, the cultural life of the city more generally. 
One thing I love about Philadelphia is that it is so vibrant culturally, more than most cities that I go to. And I think that we have made many connections at Opera Philadelphia over the years, but there are more to make and there's deeper work with those connections, whether it be dance and theater, whether it be the incredible universities here in Philadelphia. How do we mobilize both the students and the faculty to help us do more innovative work, whether it's restaurants and the burgeoning restaurants restaurant scene? How do we create the same excitement you have around going to a new restaurant and exploring that food and, and bring it to the opera and create programs that reflect our work and their work? You know, there's all kinds of untapped connections and culture that I see here. And every time, you know, I find a friend at Giovanni's Room, the bookstore, I say, oh, let's do an event around the listeners there. And what you're going to see is a festivalization of of each opera. And what I mean by that is each production that we do, big and small, is going to have a series of events and engagement opportunities around it. And those are going to be with all kinds of partners. It might be a dance performance, it might be an evening at a restaurant, it might be at a bookstore. So we want to sort of create um, a, an outpouring of collaboration around these operas that feels that has the same spirit as the O Festival did, but that is more centered around each production, building up to it, building excitement, building context, and you know, hopefully, some marketing as well. Yeah, no, that that seems like a really a really smart idea, and you know, you don't need to be told. Uh, people in Philly really. Do love food, and and, uh, and also love a party. So, uh, as an Italian Jew, food is really most of my. <laughs> that's what I look forward to most of the day. Yeah. Um, now, how is this? You know, this is a very um, clearly uh, all-consuming um, thing on your plate. How are you negotiating uh, the impact with with your? performing career, um, what what new challenges has this brought into your life? You know, it's there are no new challenges I've discovered because it turns out what I was doing before I came to Opera Philadelphia was producing as an independent producer. And I had to pick up all the pieces myself for all of these projects, whether it be, you know, Glass Handle, as we discussed, or Only an Octave Apart with Justin Vivian Bond, or, you know, um, The Marriage of Figaro on Little Island that I'm doing right now. I've always been working on creating projects, making albums, you know, producing things. So, you know, now my producing work is all focused at Opera Philadelphia, and there's an incredible staff that helps me to do that. And so I feel like I have more help than I've ever had before, which is exciting. And while it is like having two jobs at the same time, um, you'll find that opera often, once we get into the run of a show, there are many days between shows where we're not performing. And so it's really just a balance of, you know, uh, what I need to do to practice and learn and continue performing and what I need to do at Opera Philadelphia. But I find a lot of things come together. You meet a lot of supporters of opera going around the world and singing opera. You have a lot of ideas. You make a network of artists and people that you want to work with. So I can bring to bear a lot of resources. And I would say the advantages really outweigh any challenges in, in sort of tessellating the two schedules. That's good to hear. I wondered whether there is a, you know, there's any possibility that in a future production, uh, there will be a, a part in an Opera Philadelphia production for a countertenor um, that will require, you know, a very short commute for you from your administrative office to the uh, rehearsal stage. Is that is that possibly in the future? Well, the first thing I did when I got this job was to call Corrado, our incredible Corrado Rivaris, our incredible music director. And I said, Corrado, people keep asking me if I'm going to sing at Opera Philadelphia, but what do you think? Is that a bad idea? Will I look gauche if I sing at <laughs> Opera Philadelphia. And he said, no, no, you have to sing at Opera Philadelphia. We want you to. And I said, okay, okay. So as long as it doesn't upset anyone, of course I want to sing at Opera Philadelphia. I always have. I've done four or more productions here. I started when I was 14 with Luciano Pavarotti at the Academy of Music. And, you know, remember singing Written on Skin at, on the stage of the Academy and how exciting and challenging that was. Um, I love this company. I love the players in the orchestra. I love the chorus. I love the fabric of the company itself. And I, as an artist, want to make music with these people. 
you know what I mean? That's what I love to do. And that reminds me why I do opera. It inspires me to go get that money to make the opera possible, to get the people in the seats. So yes, doing the music with this company, it, it gives me great excitement. And I love that I can break the mold a little bit and be the general director who also shows up on stage and is part of the company. Yeah, I love that. And that, that actually tease up uh, a question that you've partly answered, but I want to I want to make sure that we hit it, um, which is, you know, as a as a singer and as someone who has, you know, really seen every aspect of operatic production. I mean, you've you've starred in the biggest possible, you know, production and you've also had smaller roles. You know, you've done ensemble work. I mean, it's been, as you say, a 30 year trajectory. So you come to this position with extraordinary perspective on the creative process and on the, the sort of machinery. Um, so how does that inform and, and how is that an asset for you as the general manager, as the president of this organization? You know, because that's an incredible set of um, experiences that you have um, to bring to the table, but how does it actually help? When I was in rehearsal the other day and I was singing a, a phrase, I was thinking to myself, what do I need to do musically to make this phrase communicate the emotion better to the audience? How can I shape it differently? How can I say the words differently? What, what are the dynamics? The same is true when I start to think about marketing or social media. How can I shape this differently to communicate to the audience? When I approach a fundraising meeting, I think, okay, how can we write this grant differently? How can we change the, the function of this uh, administrative system to be more effective? It's all the same kind of creative brain is what I found, that if you know, we need some new creative solutions in opera. It's clear that it's not working so well in our country right now. So I want to take the creative thinking that I've used either to make shows, to be in shows, to sing better, to sing in a chorus, to sing as a soloist. I want to take that same brain and see if it can solve some problems. So you can imagine when I use that creative brain to come up with Pick Your Price and saw that in 48 hours we had this overwhelming response, Tears came to my eyes because I thought, okay, it works. But part of innovation, and I'm very aware of this, is risk. And part of risk is failure. And I will fail. There will be failures. And creatively, we have to fail. As opera singers, sometimes we don't hit the note because we're trying to hit this really crazy high note. It's an Olympic sport. you know. So what I'm trying to do in my role is to enable risk and allow for failure, not only for me, but for everybody and for Opera Philadelphia. We will try some things, and it's very plausible that Pick Your Price could not have worked, or that there are things about it that will not work. And that's okay, because as long as we've tried it, there is some benefit we will get from it, and the learning from that will help us to advance. And I hope that with my track record, with my experience, with my imagination, that we will have more successes than failures, and that what we learn from the failures will drive us forward. But I think it's really important, just as I failed as an opera singer before, and those failures have made me a better artist artist that we allow for that as we move forward. So it's going to be an exciting time and we're, you're going to see a lot of things and we're going to try a lot of things. And some people will love it all. Some people will hate it all. But that's part of the fun. And I think that gets us into the discussion and it'll make you want to come to Opera Philadelphia. Well, amen to that. Um, we're so excited uh, for this new era for the company. We're excited to have you in Philadelphia and, of course, to have you here at WRTI. So, um, Anthony, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, and I'll be listening all the time in my office to WRTI, so I'm glad to be here. All right. Thank you. Thanks.